Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. So today I wanted to talk about the Daisy Day which is run by the charity The Daisy Network which is a charity in the UK for um, premature ovarian insufficiency or failure or early menopause however you refer to it because we all know it's got a million different names. So um, this event has sort of gone on for a few years, it was known as a conference before and this year I believe is the first year it was known as the Daisy Day. I've put off going for some time, um, I'm not entirely sure why, I think sometimes it's quite hard and I didn't know what to expect and when you kind of have our diagnosis it all seems to be doom and gloom so I didn't know if I was going to go and end up upset because it was you know this will happen to you and this will happen to you and you've got more risk of this because little do people know that I think people from the outside think that P POI is just infertility but there's so much more to it so many other health conditions which I find quite a concern but this year I was asked to speak there um, about my diagnosis and my donor egg pregnancy, which I'm now 26 weeks. Um, and I was so nervous, so nervous um, the night before, the day I was getting there, um, because it took me a couple of hours to get there as well. Um, and I walked in um, and I was like really taken back as soon as I got there because the amount of people that were there was incredible for some reason I thought it was going to be you know 20 30 people but I reckon there was you know I'm rubbish with numbers but probably 60 to 100 people and then some of the other halves were there as well and I think because it's so rare and I was so young as well I've always just been that one person that that has it and when you walk in and you're suddenly like wow there's every colour, shape, size person in this room, age, um, that had been through it too. Then, then I was really taken back, but because of YouTube and being on the Rain Kelly um, and the BBC recently with my story, I had quite a few people run up to me going, oh my God, it's you, and like treating me some, like some sort of celebrity. And I'm quite confident in front of a camera and, and when I'm like presenting, but kind of, I am quite shy, so I think I might have come across quite kind of, oh, okay, hi, but that is just me, because I'm in that sort of situation, I can be quite shy, but anyway, that's enough about me. So, the day was um, kind of, there was a few speakers there, there was myself, there was another lady who was fantastic, um, who was the other side of the spectrum, who is, is po in a positive way decided to stay childless and, and her talk was absolutely incredible. Um, but I'm just going to start off with, with how it started. So we had Nick Panay who is a specialist doctor in PUI and he's based um, I believe at the Chelsea and Westminster um, Hospital where the event took place yesterday in London. And he spoke a little bit about POI and sort of what's happening with it in, in the medical side of things. And it was really, really interesting. But I took a few notes um, and he said that there, there's like so many different places. There was like Singapore and France and everything. And they're all sort of collaborating together to get lots of data um, to with the intention of making like a database about um, POI. And people are coming forward about it more because there's more celebrities in the news um, coming out about it. So there's Angelina Jolie and uh, Michelle Heaton. And it's both the same reason. I can't remember the cell, but it's to do with um, the cancers. Uh, increased risk of cancer, cancer which is the reason that they've gone through it so they've been quite open about it and and brought it to people's attention he what they're trying to do is um, identify the difference between spontaneous POI and medically induced so medically induced is if you've had for some reason you've needed your ovaries removed or you have had cancer or radiotherapy treatments things like that that's caused you to go through the early menopause so they're trying to collect lots of blood samples to identify um, the reason why spontaneous POI happens because apparently 95% of us have no reason, no known cause. So I didn't ever get a cause. They tried to test me for Fragile X Syndrome and Turner Syndrome and it came back negative. Um, and then they just put it down to that my mum was quite early and it just was hereditary. There was a few people with their mums there yesterday and it was the same sort of story. They'd been early but not as early as you know myself, there's another girl in particular um, who works with Daisy Network who's lovely and 
it's the same with her she was a teenager she'd actually never been through puberty she never got um her periods it just they didn't work um but interestingly her sister is fine and had two children so it's it's quite i think they're trying to look into this reason why which is as they were saying sometimes there's probably never going to be a cure for it um but a lot of people need that closure for the reason why they want to know why which i can kind of understand that i've made my peace with that but i can understand why people you know kind of want that reason because i did have that did i do something wrong is there something wrong with me you know this is this outer world did they think i was going to be a bad mother and things like that so you do you know you go through that thought pattern so um they said potentially in the future however they might be able to develop gene therapy to um potentially restore the ovaries potentially but um he said like developments over the next sort of five years there's going to be a lot of looks in looking into it so i know that abroad you can have that stem cell um thing with the ovaries that um i don't exactly know how it works but he said it's too new and there's not really you know proper you know results yet to prove it works and it's a lot of money so um i think they're looking more and more into that like the stem cell gene therapy so he said with um poi the longer it takes to get a diagnosis um the weaker bones get and apparently it was taken some people like five to seven years to get a proper diagnosis and i was quite lucky um i think mine probably took under a year i can't quite remember because i was so young i just remember i went to quite a few hospital appointments so a lot of people have raised concerns about HRT and being on it long term um, because um, when you Google HRT it just comes up with you've got an increased risk of dementia and osteoporosis and breast cancers and things like that and he reassured us that yes to go on it at the normal menopause age of sort of 50 plus there is but for us like it's different it's it's like we haven't had any estrogen and things like that we need the hormones there's more benefits to not and he also said i hope i didn't hear this wrong that because we've had this protection we're also a little bit less risk of things like cancer than your everyday non-poi person so that was like really interesting i tried to write down as much as i could um so then they've done a study that com compared um, some, you know, people on a two-year study, oh, sorry, phone's on, um, that measured their bone density on HRT or the pill or with no protection, like nothing whatsoever, because the pills also used, um, the contraceptive pills also used as a form of hormone replacement for some people. I was put on that as a teenager in particular. And on the two-year study, <laughs> bones were much better um on the hrt than the contraceptive pill or nothing at all sorry just gonna turn my phone on silent i can't get it on silent there we go he's just just being random okay so um so we we require a higher level of estrogen protection as well so um he was all about that so we require more estrogen than you know your typical older menopause person lady um yeah so potentially drugs to stop hot flushes and then he was on about a kind of organization he's making up which is a privately um privately owned one so it's kind of self if you want to go it you pay for it sort of thing but i'm definitely interested in it um it's called hormone health because there's obviously loads of conditions that hormones control everything um so yeah he's working really hard on that he seemed very very passionate about it he said that the um, a lot of the funding is being pulled from our sort of um diagnosis um diagnosis condition sorry i've got baby brain today and he was even said that you know he's happy to fund things himself but you know we need to get more funding to have this research done so that was like that was really interesting and then the next lady was um kathy i'm going to write all the names in the description because i'm i am dyslexic as i've said before so i don't want to kind of pronounce names wrong she's the president of the menopause society so she deals with like menopause in a, a normal sector and also poi early menopause so um poi or early menopause is basically going for your menopause under the age of 40 and she said it's more common now in your 20s and 30s to be POI. So under 
um, 40, it's one, one in 100 women in their 40s will go through the early menopause. And then it's one in a thousand under 30. Um, and then people like me are just, I don't know, 0.1 million, I don't know, <laughs> who knows. Um, but it accounts for 25% of women presenting no periods. So people that are going to doctors with no periods, 25% of those women end up with, um, normally have a diagnosis of POI, and then the other 75% is some other reason why they haven't got periods. Um, however, periods can still be intermittent when you're POI, so um, there was a lady there that had been told that she'd had it for a few years, um, but she still got periods like sporadically, so you can have one or two a year, or it might be every other month, or every, you know, 50 days, so everyone's quite different. And so how do you know that you've got POI? Basically, no periods, periods stop, um, few periods, um, fertility issues and estrogen deficiency symptoms um, which I'm not sure, entirely sure what they are. I guess it might be the hot flushes that are due to estrogen, I might be wrong on that one. So it normally is like a lack of periods or change of periods that will um, make somebody go seek medical advice or struggling to get um, pregnant. Symptoms are flushes and sweats, tiredness, mood swings, concentration difficulties, sexual difficulty, vaginal dryness, um, and then some people have no symptoms whatsoever um, and don't know. Uh, one thing that wasn't written on there, and the reason I got diagnosed was my weight just ballooned overnight. So um, I think it can go two ways. You could lose a lot of weight or gain a lot of weight. It just depends on how your hormones react. So that wasn't said, but that's how I went to the doctors. Um, and yeah, everything sort of happened from there. But if you watch my video, you'll, you'll know my diagnosis there. Possible causes. Most are unknown why it's happened. Then there's genetic family um, inherited. Induced due to a medical issue, like I said, such as cancer treatments or removal of um, ovaries for another reason. Enzyme deficiency, but that's unusual. Infection, again, that's very unusual. And autoimmune um, and it's that's normally kind of checked through blood tests. So, so there's never, there was a big kind of detailed way of how they assess it, but apparently they should sort of test your um, follicle stimulating hormones um, every six weeks apart and pelvic scans, things like that. So mine were, from what I remember, I had a series of blood tests and um, I had internal ultrasounds, external ultrasounds where they couldn't see anything. But yeah, that was pretty much it from what I remember. Why do you need to treat it? Bone health, that's my biggest concern is bone health. Heart health, brain health, uh, bladder and vaginal health and symptom relief. How long for? Until the normal, normal men menopause range of about 50. But then you can continue on HRT and um, Nick, the first doctor was saying that he has a lady on HRT who's 90. Um, that comes up to you when that time comes and you get to your 50s and you'll discuss that with your doctor, things like that. Um, so yeah, HRT until 50, risks are different from older ladies on HRT, it will help you feel better and it's got long term um, health benefits. Choosing your HRT, um, your hormone replacement is up to you, again you could have the normal contraceptive pill or you can have normal HRT but that can be pill, patches or gels. Um, personally for me I've never tried patches or gels, I just think I forget taking a tablet, I take them with my supplements in the morning and even then I can forget them, which used to be annoying on certain HRTs. If I missed one, I would start a period like halfway through the day. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, and headaches, it'd just be like too late, be like, no, I've not taken it on time. Um, so it's like if you want bleeds or not. So the reason you might want bleeds is if you do plan to have a future pregnancy, which again, if you watch my video, um, at the start of my IVF, my uterus was really, really tiny. My HRT was way too low. I didn't have bleeds, so my uterus was just tiny and thin and just not ready for carrying a baby whatsoever. It did then get corrected through higher HRT, but this is something you might want to talk about with your doctor. So as nice as it might not seem, um, seem to not have periods, if you do want to go through fertility treatment, you do need to think about that. Um, that wasn't the reason I wasn't um, on a higher HRT. I was having, I have 
other side effects on HRT that just like headaches and really sore breasts and I'm a fitness instructor so jumping around with sore boobs just, just isn't the thing for me, doesn't really work. So that was the reason it wasn't uh, to not have periods. So um, they seemed concerned that there's a lot of the kind of bio-identical hormones coming out, um, HRT, but apparently a lot of the the, the prescribed ones in the UK are bio identical but they don't just say it to you but people are doing having tailor made ones that aren't necessarily licensed or, or regulated so to make sure that if you are getting a tailor made bio identical form of HRT make sure they are licensed and regulated because there is reasons for that but many of the ones that your doctor will prescribe are actually bio identical so it's just worth having that chat with your doctor um, they should know, but it kept coming up all day that the doctors aren't really that, you know, your general GPs aren't really that up to, you know, knowledge with HRT for us guys. Um, and it's something that they're really trying to work towards to get them kind of have a centre everywhere. So in London, like they've got them, so it's great, but they need to kind of get medical professionals like up and down the country that do specialised clinics for us and it's something they're looking at doing and they're trying to work hard for. So what else can you do to help your um, your POI? So diet, it's got to be good, you know how I feel about that. And calcium and vitamin D for your bones, especially vitamin D in this country because we get about 10 days of sunshine a day, especially in the winter exercise the weight bearing exercise that doesn't mean you have to do high impact because um again from my fitness background professional background um some people just aren't able to do high impact for many reasons and if you've already got the signs of bone issues or you've got joint pain then high impact is not going to be the one um that can be sort of weight bearing and everything check out my bone density video as well and that will give you some indications of how i got my bone density back up into the normal range um don't smoke because that really affects your bone density apparently i don't smoke anyway but i was like oh okay um alcohol not too much sexual health um with your relationships because just because you've got poi you might not want children at all or you may not want them at that point in your life especially you know i was um when i was officially diagnosed i was 13 i wouldn't have wanted any children then um so through my teens you want contraception basically um support psychological as well as physical um definitely psychological i think you have to be ready for it um i was saying this in my talk yesterday i think a lot of the time i kind of brushed it off and made it more comical than it was as a way to deal with it and it was only probably about three years ago that i had counseling for something else but a lot of it led back to how i dealt with this condition and I had like six months of counselling and it's like everything just fell into place and I accepted it and I'm a much happier person now. So the right kind of psychological support at the right time um, and find it what's right for you. I've had counsellors for the NHS which have tried to um, make problems that weren't there. Yeah, be careful with that one. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so you know whatever your support system is you might not need counseling you might um as one of the, the speakers was saying she went to retreats and that helped her i went quite um you know i really got into yoga last year and that sort of retreat kind of thing that works for me she does meditation i did a lot of meditation to get me through my ivf so it, it doesn't have to be counseling it could literally be going to i don't know fencing or tennis or whatever just whatever you need to kind of deal with that diagnosis and, and accept it um is what's right for you so um then it was a q a um i didn't write all of these down but my i felt awful yesterday because one reason i was so nervous when i got there is that i walked into a room and i was that person that i used to dread seeing um and i think for a lot of people it's really emotional being there and then for a pregnant women to walk in <laughs> i've had that feeling when you know you could just see a pregnant woman at the wrong time and i felt so horrible 
that I was that person. Um, and I spoke to a couple of person, people there about how I felt and they were saying, no, no, you shouldn't, you know, you're here to say you can, you know, you can do it. But I felt really, really guilty. Um, and then I was mad at myself. I was like, I can't feel guilty. I've, you know, I've had this for 17 years. Um, but yeah, and then I asked the question and I went, I'm really sorry, but I need to ask one about pregnancy because I've been told so many conflicting things about breastfeeding and your bone density that I wanted to like, um, just just know once and for all. So basically, um, yeah, I read that, um, I was told by one doctor that if you breastfeed, it can really affect your bone density. So um, I asked Nick and he said, short term, three to six months could be um, fine. You can actually go back on HRT whilst you breastfeed as well, which I didn't know, um, like a bioidentical bio HRT. Long term, like people breastfeeding for years is probably not um, recommended. You will lose some bone density during pregnancy. Um, and just have bone density scan after your pregnancy, which I plan to do anyway. But I'm going to do a separate video about the whole breastfeeding thing because that's, you know, that wasn't a big thing there. Um, yeah, and that was sort of like the medical bit. And then we had a nutritional talk. Um, so it was Nourish Mind, Body and Spirit by Tanif Lee, Mrs. Menopause. I think I've said her name right. Um, and she was this bright, bubbly personality, but she spoke about her diagnosis in a very raw form um, of how she took it. But she was, you know, took it pretty badly. And it was, every talk, I had tears in my eyes. It was so emotional. Um, because all the speakers were just so honest about how they how they were. Um, so she was just like, nourish your mind, body and spirit. Don't have a specific diet. But there's things that you can add to your diet and not take away. So you're, you're supported, but you're not, you know, not having this and not having that. Which is, you know, how I preach to my clients as well. So yeah, diet diet tweaks and supplements. Um, she was recommending omega three, oily fish and water. Um, caffeine and alcohol are a trigger for hot flushes. Um, sugar as well isn't particularly good. And she has um, a symptom diary that you can request from her. That every day of the month you can write down your symptoms and try and see if there's a cycle. Because even though we don't have a normal menstrual cycle, she believes that we still have a cycle of you know symptoms and things. Which I yeah I agree with. She said um, you know keep it simple. Thinking of adding water, adding vegetables. You know not saying don't have this, don't have this. Um, surprisingly actually she said if you struggle with sleep that you know watch your caffeine because even like seven hours later caffeine can affect you and your blood sugar level i know that i struggle with sleep but i'll get in from work and eat something um at like 10 o'clock at night and then that's probably why i don't sleep so i'm trying to address that but she also said um a magnesium supplement a good quality one not you know a really cheap one will help your um sleep and yeah and then you know exercise build strength weight bearing exercise um and then yeah access access support groups online um and then i stopped um taking notes because then i was talking um about my kind of background and i went over everything so again if you check out my um video my early menopause video that will sort of tell you my whole diagnosis the q a i found really really emotional because people were bringing up things that were happening to me when i was 13 that was 17 years ago almost 18 years ago and it was still going on um i got told uh, he just went when you want a family you won't be able to have one come back in about 15 years when you want one and walked out the room and i was crying and i um so that was bad enough so how i was told was quite bad enough and then i had to walk out through the waiting room in a maternity unit people looking at me because i was overweight like i'd just been told i was pregnant you know and i'm a teenager um so you know people still were kind of saying is there anything that they're going to do to stop us sitting with pregnant women this time last year i had um i was looking in i had to a checkup on my hrt and i had to sit in the room for the pregnant women and i'm normally okay but i was having a full-on panic attack to the point where I was going to ask to be moved out of the room because my appointment was running late and um, I had the appointment, didn't really get any answers and then I think I cried for about three hours straight because just being in that room when you've got to address your medical issue and you're sat next to like pregnant people and it's just hard and that's why I felt really guilty being there pregnant yesterday. I felt so, oh, I felt awful. I kind of was trying to cover my bump for a little bit. I was, I felt really bad. Um, and then somebody, this girl, bless her, she was uh, watching my channel, so she was watching hell. She was telling me that she got um, diagnosed six weeks ago and told over the phone. Other people's got sent.